um, or fi finite or infinite space. And, and really, the, the most comprehensive shape in column two is is a cylindroid. You know, like a cylindroid. You know, if you if you take this cylindroid with two red lines and clump, and make its height zero, it turns into a disk. Whereas if you take this one, clump it to zero, it turns into that disk, right? If if you take the heights of these cylindroids um, and make them infinitely large, so so cylindroids, you know, they're supposed to have a, a finite h. If it goes to zero, it turns into a disk. If it becomes infinitely large, it turns into um, one of these guys, the planes. And if you pull these to infinity, it turns into these. So, so hopefully you can see, um, you know, these things are just really all one in the same shape that's just morphing into other, other shapes within each column. Um, and the other neat thing to recognize is the complementary constraint spaces. Um, oh, and by, by the way, another interesting insight. Of course, if you pull this, this green disk of screws to infinity in this direction, say in, in the direction of its plane, it will turn into a plane of parallel green lines, and the translation will turn into this one. So if you take this and pull it that way, it'll, it'll manifest as this one, just like if I take the red disk and pull it to infinity, it'll manifest as this one, where these are all the same pitch screws. Well, that tells you then, of course, that that's another proof that you know a, a screw pulled to infinity is a translation because you see a translation there. You know, take that disk, pull it to infinity, it's that, and you can see that one screw that's perpendicular to that direction turned into the translation. So that's another proof of that. But the other interesting thing is, is like, look, it's easy to visualize what a disk pulled to infinity is as a plane of parallel lines, but try and imagine what it would be like. Take all these nested circular hyperboloids with this vertical line here, very special relationship, and pull that to infinity and try and imagine what that would look like. That just boggles the mind. You can't intuit that, but you can deduce because you can intuit if you pull a disk to infinity, it manifests as this freedom space. It, it lends itself, it, it's logical to deduce that it, the complementary space of this disk then pulled to infinity is this guy's constraint space. You can mathematically prove it, of course, but it's just cool to think this one, you can imagine pulling a green disk to infinity, it becomes a green plane of parallel lines. Well, that means by logic that it's complementary constraint space pulled to infinity is this crazy constraint space of, of rotating hyperbolic paraboloids, you know, stacked together or, or parallel planes rotating at p equals d tan theta relationship is actually this guy pulled to infinity. So um, it, it's really, you can actually kind of start comprehending and visualizing infinity um, and finite space and how they blend into each other uh, and how they manifest by, by studying this, this, this chart and, and re recognizing if the freedom space manifests as something else, the constraint space does too. Okay, so lots of, lots of cool realizations to kind of think about how all these shapes morph into each other. Um, <clears throat> okay, but let, let's look at the math behind displacing stuff to infinity. We've already kind of looked at this, but let's do it for a freedom space. So. Remember, any twist can be described by, you know, let, let's call it a displacement omega. You know, we, we did omega, but this is a displacement twist. We did delta omega, some infinitesimal thing. Um, there's a C, you know, three by one C vector, three by one omega vector, or in this case, theta, right, because it's a displacement twist, and there's a pitch. And you, you put it together like this. This is how you construct a twist, right? Now, how do you, now say you have this um, freedom space that's located in the center of the coordinate system where you know there's a rotation in x, a rotation in y, translation in z. Well, what you could do is you could construct those three twists and then add them together and find the, the, the twist freedom space, which would look something like this, where here's the independent magnitudes, right? So this is a, a very nice uh, twist wrench, or, sorry, uh, twist freedom space. To, to summarize all the motions within this, this plane. And we, we've done this. This is just, you know, we're finding the twist freedom space by linearly combining them. Well, let's, let's actually redo this, but, but have it displaced a distance d away from the coordinate system. Let's say the thing we care about is on the coordinate system. Here's the block. We're going to say this is displaced a distance d. Well, then if you construct all three twists, uh, t1, t2, and t3, the translation and the two rotations, and you linearly combine, you know, you construct those, linearly combine those, you'll get something like this, okay? And then, but then you can say, well, what happens when d 
equals infinity. D gets larger and larger and larger. If D equals infinity, then the only way these can be finite and real and make any sense is if also, also delta theta 2 and delta theta 3 become 0 because you know 0 times infinity can be any real finite number. And so basically we have to make delta 3 and delta 0, or <laughs> delta theta 3 and delta theta 2 0, so these have to be 0, and then these can be finite values k2 and k3, and then this is just the same thing. So basically what that says is this is the freedom space, the twist freedom space that results of making d go infinitely far. And guess what this is? All the rotations are 0, and you have three independent translations, which is the twist, which is the freedom space twist of this freedom space. So essentially, you, you set, what, what you do is you set up the freedom space some distance away in the direction you want to displace it with a finite distance, construct its, its freedom space twist, and then force the distance parameter to infinity, uh, make everything zero that's multiplying so it can be a real finite thing, and then plug it in and, and, and you'll, and then decompose and reinterpret the twists of this and you will construct the, the freedom space that it turns into. Okay, so that, that's one way you can find out what space turns into what space mathematically and what direction you need to pull it in, okay? Um, and, and, you know, I would have loved to, con you know, I could have, in this chart, I could have told you directions if you could only pull it in orthogonal directions, but there's obviously infinite directions you can pull these in, and they can actually change even if they're not pulled in orthogonal directions. So since there's infinite directions, I couldn't contain information about the directions here, but this chart is very useful because you just look it up, see what options you have, you can usually intuit what direction to pull it in. You, you'll want to usually pull it in an orthogonal direction because it's clean. And, uh, and now you have the math to figure out exactly what direction, how to use it. So, so let's do an example here. Here's the systematic steps. Um, and we'll go through each one. So step one is specify the degrees of freedom you want. Okay? Say we wanted three translations with orthogonal translations with no rotations. Well, okay. step two, look up on the fact chart. Okay, here it is. Um, okay, 3DF type 20 contains those three. That's its freedom space. It, it, you know, this tells you you have to synthesize a serial or hybrid system. You can't do it with a parallel system. Okay, but au contraire, we can if we use the theory I just taught you. We can at least mimic it. Okay. Okay, and so, so um, what we do is we look up my new chart, 3DF type 20. 3DF type 20, and it's right here. It says 3 of type 20 is mimicked when types 1, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 20, 21, and 22 are displaced to infinity. So that, that, that means we've got quite a few options. Let me, I'll, I'll circle them all. Notice some are outside the parallel pyramid. Some are inside the parallel pyramid. We definitely want to find one that's inside the parallel pyramid, right? Um, because um, what good would it be to, to mimic... Uh, a freedom space outside the parallel pyramid with a freedom space outside the parallel pyramid because it wouldn't have a constraint space to make a parallel thing. You'd have to make a serial hybrid thing. And if you're going to do that, you might as well nail it exactly instead of mimic it, right? So, so um, this gives you all the options. You look at all the options and you only consider the ones in the parallel pyramid if you want to design a parallel system that mimics this, okay? And so again, I, I recommend you pick an easy one. This is as easy as they get. And you can hopefully visualize, you can try pulling it in, a, in a, all of its orthogonal directions in your head. Um, and if not, then start trying pulling in weird directions and use math. You can figure out what direction it becomes. But according to this, we know that if we pull this in a certain direction, it'll become that from that chart. And hopefully we find out if you pull it in this direction uh, to infinity, it'll become that. Okay, so once you know, once you've picked one that will work, that will mimic it, and you know what direction to pull it in, then you pull it in that direction and make the stage a certain length. How do you pick the length of the stage? You use that one equation where, you know, you want to, with D and E is, E is the error, you, you know, and, and you use those and those equations to find the, the, the shortest length L needs to be, the stage needs to be, and maybe give it a little conservative nudge, make it a little longer. Okay, then take the constraint space of that freedom space and, and go through your sub-constraint spaces and synthesize it so it's, 
exactly constrained. This is obviously over constrained to be symmetric. Symmetry is going to help get rid of parasitic errors as well, obviously. And sure enough, you will mimic that freedom space and do the impossible of achieving the three Holy Grail you know, translations with no rotations, um, but with a, a long stage. And it's far away from all the, all the, you know, you can put sensors and actuators right in the area you care about, and it's far away from the flexures, so they won't interfere. So could be pretty useful. Okay, let, let's do that. But we've done that design example a bunch. So let's do some practice, uh, you know, practice. Um, let's practice this approach with something you're not familiar with, okay? So suppose we wish to achieve these four degrees of freedom, okay? Three translations and a rotation, okay? Well, um, what we do is we look up and we find that that uh, manifests as this freedom space. It's every rotation in a sphere and a, a box of parallel r r rotations as well as a box of parallel screws of all pitches, okay? And we find it there. We see, oh my goodness, it's outside the parallel pyramid. So if we're going to design a parallel system to achieve that, it better be, um, it, it, we're only going to be able to mimic it with a parallel system. We'll never get it exactly. We could do it serial and hybrid exactly um, if we design it well, but... Um, we're not going to do it exactly with a parallel thing. But let, let's, for kicks, let's design a parallel thing because that's the point of this lecture. So we look at 4DUF type 10 in the chart. Let's see, 4DUF type 10. Here it is. It says, is mimic when types 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 are displaced to infinity. So that essentially means everything in this column displaced to infinity can manifest as itself. And by the way, some spaces, when they displace to infinity, obviously can manifest as themselves. I've told you, if you, take a, if you take the plane of parallel red lines and displace it to infinity in its plane in either direction, it will manifest as itself. Okay? Um, and so that's why, that's why the space itself will, will do it. So, um, so, but anyway, <laughs> that chart for this example wasn't terribly useful. Or maybe it is. You know you have 10 different options you could displace to infinity um, in a certain direction to, to, to mimic this one. But now it is useful because, because you, know, you don't want to pick anyone outside the parallel pyramid. You just want to pick these three. You can pick any of these three within the parallel pyramid and it'll work. And you look at these and it's like, this is ugly. So um, maybe you'll use one of these. Okay, so either of these could work. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, Okay, so, so then, uh, and, and by the way, yeah, so, so this one's interesting. Um, this one's the box with a parallel plane. If you just lift that up or, or pull it down, it's that plane, you know, the box won't move. You can't move a box. It's already, you know, to imagine pulling a box to infinity in any direction. It's just going to stay a box. But that plane, when it pulls down, will turn into the sphere and everything, and these guys will turn into the box, right, um, as, as you pull those down. So, so this one's very interesting. This one will work if you pull it to infinity down. But let, let's use this one. This one's a little easier, okay? Um, and, uh, and you can find pretty quickly just by visualizing, you know, we, you know this is an option, so you can try pulling it to infinity in different directions. But if you try and pull it down or up, you can see, um, you know that uh, this plane and this translation arrow will turn into the sphere, you already know that, and you know this sphere will turn into the box, right? So, so you can hopefully visualize that without doing the math. If you need to do the math, you could describe four twists, linearly combine them, pull them to infinity, make the D go to infinity, and then reinterpret the space and you'll find this. Um, but, but hopefully you can see that spheres turn into boxes, planes pulled to infinity turn into spheres of translations, and so that's how you do it. And then you'd calculate the distance between you know, here's the thing you want to achieve. Uh, you know, calculate the length the stage needs to be so you can tolerate all the errors uh, with the parasitic errors. And, uh, and then find the constraint space of this, which is just a disk. Um, we could synthesize it to be exactly constrained if we just did two. But to make it nice and symmetric, we over-constrained it by, by two. And then uh, we grounded it. And so there's our parallel system that you could visualize. And it's nicely assembled in a 2D structure. And you could visualize it could indeed um, translate up with no parasitic error, rotate around this axis with no parasitic error, because we made this symmetric, 
and then it would translate in this direction, this direction, um, with parasitic air, because it's actually rotating here and here, right? Um, but hopefully you made the stage long enough that you can tolerate that parasitic error. Okay? Okay, so if, it's just by, out of curiosity, you know, so just, just for experience and practice and everything, um, uh, it might be worth your time to try and synthesize something that achieves this combination of degrees of freedom that is serial um, and, and, and does it exactly. Um, and, and one way you could do that is with this serial system. You can see this is, here's one parallel module. Here's another parallel module stacked on top. This, this is over-constrained by one here, that parallel module. This is over-constrained by quite a bit. On this whole side is over-constrained. This is over-constrained.